is Master Ravenmain. I am from the Kingdom of Aidenveld. Um, I have been uh, majority, I've been in the SCA almost 30 years. Um, I have been a uh, majority of the time. Um, I've been working, I was a scribe. So even though I delved into so many different arts, um, scribe was my one of my main ones. Um, I started, I have decided on when I started painting on fabric, but it's it started, we started painting on, fa uh, sorry, I started painting on fabric uh, on clothing, on, uh, on uh, dresses and tunics and stuff like that. So now I pay, I paint full achievement banners. So what I'm going to go through on the PowerPoint today is just um, my supplies, my way of doing things. Um, obviously, you can do any way you want to do it or however you want to experiment with the paints that you do. Um, uh, my way is not the only way. Um, I am going to share my handout to the chat section. Um, I included some, not all, but I included some um, references to painting on fabric on the end. I didn't include all of them. Um, up until recently, um, uh, within the last couple of years, five years maybe or so, um, I was able to uh, collect uh, a lot of other individuals, like individuals who uh, paint on fabric and have done a lot of research and um, some of it, you know, majority of it was conjecture only because uh, anything painting on fabric historical wise, there's not a whole lot still uh, available. Um, there is, but it's just very hard to find. And uh, what I, so far I found nothing on clothes. Um, you can find paint on banners and sometimes even on livery, you might be able to see some kind of remnants, but um, uh, when they painted on fabric in history, what I found out is that majority of the time it's um, it was made to be temporary. It was never made to be permanent. So, for instance, uh, they would paint if they had festivals <clears throat> in Italy. <clears throat> excuse me, in Italy they had, uh, for example, when they did festivals, <clears throat> they uh, they painted on clothes for the festival or for whatever they were doing. And that was it. <clears throat> Clothes didn't last much longer than that because the uh, paint was heavy and putting them on, on fabric and all that and stuff and how they, you know, testing it out. So um, in other places like uh, around France and maybe in England, they may have painted on clothes for theatrical purposes. So um, a lot of theaters, especially the, you know, the, the lower end theaters, um, they couldn't even afford like fake jewelry. So they painted a lot of the jewelry on their clothes. So they would paint, you know, jewels on, on dresses and stuff like that. Um, and anybody knows who knows about the theater knows that even if it wasn't painted, clothes didn't last that long either. So, um, and all that information has come from books, obviously, because there's no um, actual pieces left. Um, but let me start my handout here. go through supplies and how to this is painting fabric me Jeremy remain uh, there's my email uh, it's on the handout so if you have any questions afterwards or you would like to be uh, painting on fabric becomes the thing you might be interested in. Um, I run a local guild of painters, uh, and it's spelled P A Y N T E R. That was the guild from uh, England when they were for their uh, historical uh, guild. Um, I also run a, a known world uh, historical painters group. A lot of them don't get a lot of attention as much as I would like, or traffic as much as I would like, but I do have places, at least two places that have um, some references in the, in the file section. So if you're gonna <clears throat> paint on fabric, um, these are the supplies. I use acrylic paint, so any acrylic paint you get in any um, craft store, 
uh, usually is folk art or Americana, but name brand doesn't matter really too much because they're all similar. They're not exactly the same, but they're similar. And if you get them on a good sale, you can get them at $50, you know, 50, 50 cents a, a bottle, which is, you know, a couple ounces. Um, but on when they're not on sale, they could be up upwards of a dollar fifty ish for for. Uh, so if you're going to start out, get like a generic, um, you know, multi, you know the gen, you know the basic colors. Um, I use um, another paint called Lumiere. It's uh, it's by Jacquard. Um, it is a more expensive paint, but I use it for like metallics, um, and it and it's easier to clean and everything else. So it's it's it, it paid for itself, but um, like I said, it's more expensive. And the reason I use it is because uh, not only because they better, the metallics I like a lot better, um, but it also has a medium, which I'll get into uh, next. Uh, it has a medium infused in it already from the factory. So I don't have to mix it together. And the medium is just something that helps um, the paint adhere better to the fabric. And when it dries, it's more flexible. So it's not as rigid and it's uh, less likely to, uh, to chip off when you, when you paint certain things. So the textile medium, um, there are uh, different kinds. There's a textile medium for acrylic paint and then there's a uh, different textile medium for that. That's uh, for acrylic paint that you use for canvases. Um, you'll know the difference because you'll look at the, the bottle and it'll say uh, slow, medium or fast dry times. And that's so when you're painting, um, you can you know, make sure that something is dry before you start painting some, something else on canvas. Um, and you want different drying times. So if it's just for acrylic paint, it's not even going to bother to tell you how, you know, speed it's going to dry. It's just going to be regular textile medium. Um, metallics and textile mediums in general in any hobby store that I've been in is always in a weird place. Um, sometimes it'll, it'll be with the acrylic paint. Sometimes it'll be on the, you know, across the aisle. I don't know why, but it's for some reason, every hobby store has a they don't always put it with the with the uh, with the acrylics. Um, textile medium is usually two to one, so it's two parts paint, one part uh, medium. But if you buy it, make sure that you read the bottle because it might be a little bit different. The Jacquard, uh, by the way, is heat set, which means um, they recommend that if you paint it, you iron it. Um, and I'll get into ironing this stuff later, but it needs to be either ironed or put, or we can put it in the dryer. Um, I use uh, lots of acrylic brushes. Um, mostly one I use is angle, um, but you could use a regular uh, standard. You can use any brush at all. I use angle only because it's it's similar in shape to, or, or the same does the same thing as a, a quill, which means that you can do fine point and and uh, wide and change back and forth. And that's why I use angle. But you can use any brush you want, whatever works for you. Putting something under your fabric, I use a thicker ounce, which is a thicker or a thicker weight um, fabric. Usually, when I paint on, usually all these uh, natural uh, fabrics like uh, cotton or linen. Um, and I don't normally have to do this, but this is just a good general thing: is to put something underneath it. Um, I had used a little shower curtain when I do teaching, or wax paper, or parchment paper is one of the best ones. And just put it on a table, whatever you're going to paint on, um, in case it does go through. Uh, paper towels, always good to have on hand, uh, water cup to clean your brushes in, all of this stuff, uh, not near your painting, whatever you're painting. So that way, if you swing your arm, remove your arm, or if you, whatever, you have a cat, kids, whatever, uh, that doesn't get onto where you're painting. So you want all the, your paints, even though you, it's easier to have them where you want, where you need them, things like the cleaning cup and paper towels you want where you have to at least reach to them. So they're not where you want. Um, sometimes the fabric has a tendency to move depending on the thickness of your fabric or what you use. Um, so I use small weights. Uh, there's actually, you can actually buy uh, fabric weights, but whatever, you know, paperweight, whatever you can do, uh, put it on the outside rim of wherever you're painting just to keep it from moving. Cause sometimes your arm shifts it and may distort your image, whatever you put on. So. Um, I've had other people too that pin it down like they do silk banners or uh, clamp it down to the table. So 
just try to make sure whatever you do, you don't, you're not stretching the fabric when you're weighing it down, like I said, because you don't want to distort your image. Um, I use I use a lot of paint, so sometimes I'll use a instead of using a out of the a palette, I will use make sure I'll put the paint in smaller jars. Um, so a lot of small containers will, will probably be helpful to mix the the medium into it and everything else. Um, iron, like I said, iron iron board. It's not mandatory, but for you got to make sure you read the paint to see whether it's heat set or not. Um, I also have cotton pieces of fabric or towel next to me, um, only because you want certain things in reach, like I mentioned earlier, to be a water cup, paint, stuff like that. But you want something in, in your, within quick reach, so you're not gonna knock anything else over. In case you spill or you do something, um, if you have to maybe wash your item to hopefully try and salvage what you painted, um, you may not be able to pick up the whole piece that you're doing. So uh, just to tell, you know, wipe yourself off, make sure it doesn't get on the floor, whatever you need. It's always good to have some sort of towel or something next to you where you can uh, grab it. I also use those um, not, you know, that are still relatively clean for putting between uh, the item and uh, the iron and the ironing board so that I'm not directly ironing um, the paint because it's acrylic paint. And some of the acrylic paint, if your iron is too hot, will melt and come off on every surface, including your iron. Um, always have a good sized table um, so that you don't you don't have to paint and uh, wait for a section to, especially if you're painting a lot of big section. Um, it's good to have a table that you can move all the way around, move your chair rather than move your item, move your whatever you're painting on, usually, you know, like a dress or a tunic or whatever, you want to make sure that uh, it's a lot easier to move around the table if you want to do it. Um, I use extra fine point Sharpies um, for not only outlining my original design, but sometimes I do it to re-outline. And it's a scribal thing where it's called, it's, it's like a black work technique. And basically what it is, is that once you draw your design and you paint your design, sometimes you go over the line and going back over it with a with a with a bleed proof uh, sharpie or pen, um, you can go over real go over the black lines. Um, this is something that you, everybody is going to have to test for themselves because I use a sharpie, extra fine point sharpie, but other people use fabric pens, uh, gel pens, all kinds of stuff like that. I've run into problems where a pen will say it bleeds and it. It doesn't bleed and it does bleed. So I've had I've had really hard problems. So I've kind of stuck to my my guns when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, I didn't fix this. This is actually a 13, so I'll have to mark that. There's actually a 13 on the bottom. I forgot what it was. Um, fabric preparation. Uh, just like if you if anybody that makes clothes and stuff, you want to wash wash whatever you're gonna make in hot water. Uh, you want to shrink it as probably much as you can. You want your uh, the fibers of everything that um, you're going to be painting on to be as close as possible. So uh, hot water works. Uh, ironing before you paint on it helps. Um, so you're not painting over bumps and, and uh, wrinkles and stuff like that. Um, when you wash your fabric, make sure you do it uh, with very little soap. Um, no fabric softener because fabric softener will stick uh, to your fabric, uh, and it, it, it's, it'll be a coating between your fabric and you and your paint. Uh, so basically the, you're painting on the, the fabric softener and not actually the fabric. So the paint is, might come off. So never do that. Um, I also am safe because I don't want anything on my, my clothes when I wash it. So, um, I, uh, what I mean by that is I make sure that my soap is no perfume, no dyes, no anything. And uh, when I wash it, um, when you dry it, put it in the dryer, make it the hottest setting. Like I said, you want you want your pre whatever you're doing to be as shrunk as possible, uh, to be as you know pre shrunk as possible. So you want to put it when you dry it in hot. Uh, it brings all, like I said, brings all the fibers together when you paint it. So, and that's what you want because you want as 
there are small, tiny holes that you probably can't see, especially with the uh, natural fabric fabrics, which I paint on. Um, so you want to reduce the possibility as well. I mean, you want to get, when you paint, you want it to get in uh, between the fibers, but you don't want that space to be too, too wide. Um, when you're painting, you got to think about your design uh, and how you want to put it on your item, whether it's a dress, for this example, or uh, a tunic or whatever, even if it's on a banner, you want to make sure that the design looks like you want it. Um, when, for this example, for a dress, you want to uh, maybe draw it out first, see what you want, how you want things to go on there. Um, what I also do as an extra thing is I print out the design in different sizes and I pin them on the dress or I pin them on the tunic or whatever. And then I step back and I see if it's too big or too large, if, you're, if it looks good. Uh, rather getting all that information prior to putting it on rather than getting it, uh, getting it later when you can't change it. So um, what I suggest for a lot of uh, people that are doing dresses, um, if they're not 100% comfortable with painting on a dress. Um, I, I let I, I give them a suggestion to um, when they're designing this dress that they make it with a band on the bottom, a long band, so that way they can paint the band. And if it doesn't, if they don't like it, or if it rips, even if it rips later or something else happens, you can take the band off and replace it. So, or if you're painting the band and it hasn't even been on the dress yet and you screw up, you can still just get another piece of fabric, um, hopefully from the same dye lot, and be able to put it on your dress. So uh, there are two things to remember when you're doing ice on clothes. Um, paint, the more paint you put on it, the heavier your garment's going to be. The, where you painted the section, the, same, the sections you painted will be, will pull on, pull on your garment. So there's a question in the chat. Sure. Can you read it to me? I can't see it. Oh, yeah. Uh, do you generally paint on the finished garment or paint on the fabric pieces cut out pre-sewing? Um, I've done both. Um, and it depends on what your comfort zone is. Um, the people that I know that, that do a lot of block printing usually do it prior to. They do it on the fabric prior to and then cut out their pattern. Um, I sometimes paint mid construction. So that way um, I, I do it so that way I can still access the, the inside of the dress. Um, usually the sleeves I'll paint prior to, um, but sometimes if I'll paint a dress that's mostly done, but the sleeves haven't been put on yet. And I, I don't know if I, I think I have a picture of it here somewhere, but basically I put the dress in the center of the table and I fan it out. So that way I can paint the, the circumference of the of the dress without moving everything around. So um, you could do, like I said, it depends on what your design is. If it's supposed to be a pattern, it's probably good to put it on prior to because that's something that aesthetically looks normal that everybody does. So you know, if you if you had any fabric pa pattern pattern on a fabric anywhere. You know, even if you didn't put on there, you know, it would cut off some of the design. So, um, but so a lot of the designs that I do, um, like I said, I do mid construction um, or towards the end, just to get a better idea of where things are placed at. But that's what I do. Um, um, this is the application. Um, there's many ways to get your design on there. I painted, if, if it's been painted, if you've seen something painted anywhere, I probably painted it. So I painted walls for uh, camps, I painted pavilions, I painted dresses, I painted tunics, um, I painted banners, boxes, I painted almost everything. So uh, depending on what you're painting, you're gonna need something like that. You know, need the right tool to get your design on whatever you're painting. Um, if the fabric is light enough uh, or thin enough, um, I'll, I'll use a light table. 
which you can get them now for like, I think that one is like $23, but you can get them at different sizes. Uh, this one that's pictured, the, the one on the left is, um, I just bought like a year or two, year, two years ago and it's super light and it can go anywhere and you can put in it its USB port. Um, the only thing I don't like about it is it's got a touch on and off and intensity light. So, you know, brushing across it doesn't help when you're trying to do it. So it's, you have to place it. Other than that, it's a good item. Um, one of them is a tracer or an opaque projector, which, which is on the bottom is 1800s um, that you need. So like for the walls that I did, um, I hung it on a door. Uh, some of the banners that I do, um, I actually made this contraption to hang this opaque projector from the, from a, a structure to go down to the floor so I could trace it. But a friend of mine also did ones where they hung it on their garage door so they could paint a wall for their, for their camp. So however you figure out, you know, you can do it this way. Um, or stencil, if you're doing a smaller item. Stencil is one of the best ways I think of getting a design on there because you can get, it's a rigid form. So that way this design, especially if you're doing multiples, um, you either uh, can do, you know, stamping or a stencil, which is probably the best way to do it. Um, to trace your item, you can do, uh, you can use chalk, which is probably one of the best ways to do it. Um, but I use, um, I use, still use my Sharpie to draw out my designs on a lot of different stuff. So um, the way you run into problems or issues, if you have any, um, you're gonna do it with a, a darker fabric because sometimes um, you can't really use a black Sharpie on a black dress. Um, so I've used silver Sharpie sometimes and I've also used chalk sometimes. Um, so you might have to alter on that kind of stuff. But whatever you can do to get your design um, onto your, your clothes, uh, you can. One of the period historical ways is called uh, prick and pounce. Um, they've done, they did this for illuminations. They've done this on, for embroidery. So they've done, this is a pretty long standing way of doing things. Um, you can also do it freehand if you want to do your, if you're really good at freehand drawing. But prick and pounce is you just take a, a, a copy of your drawing and then you put it where you, uh, you poke holes in it all along the lines, like in the center picture, you poke all the lines in wherever you're gonna, you know, you want your drawing. And then you either use chalk or there's powder. You can buy professional, professional is the right word. Um, you can buy a set, you can buy a kit, and the kits can range for a couple hundred dollars. Um, but, you know, you can use a thumbtack and, you know, cricket or chalk and grind it up. So it depends on how, what you want to do. But there's actually a, a, you know, a kit that comes with an actual pen with a needle on it. So um, anyway, you uh, put your drawing where you want it on your, on your clothes, whatever, or wherever you're painting on, and then you just pounce the chalk or powder or whatever on top. And then when you lift your paper up, you're going to have what's on the bottom right hand corner, which is just a basic line, you know, basic idea of where you want. And then you just go back and you can connect the dots and uh, with a pen or something else. Um, and then when you wash it, all that should come out. Um, so that, sure. you have to test a piece of whatever factor they can run. But like I said, Good, sir. Yeah, if I ahead. may ask, are there any are there any things you should not use for your powder? Who I would say stick with chalk. Chalk is pretty much universally okay. Um, only because I know people who eat chalk uh, when they were kids. So I would stick with chalk as the best powder um, and try not to do anything else because you don't want, um, and most often chalk is also meant to come out of things. So when you wash it, it should come out. Um, some of the other chalks that you can use um, are not uh, like the professional ones that they use for, you know, for lines and stuff um, for uh, construction. Those aren't, you know, uh, coming out of fabric is not one of their main concerns. So there's some some chalks that that don't come out. So you want to make sure that whatever you're using is 
Um, if you can grind it yourself, it's probably the best ones, the cheap ones you can get like a dollar or a box or whatever from, you know, a Hobby Lobby store. I don't know if they sell ground up chalk anywhere. I'm assuming they might, but yeah, you don't want anything that stays in the, in the clothes or dies of the clothes or um, try and stick with, with chalk that's, that you can see, but doesn't stand out because if you, you don't want, hopefully no dyes or anything to come off and stay in the, in the clothes when you wash them. Would flour work? Flour, yeah, flour should work. Um, you just have to make sure, yeah, you wash it all the way out because you don't want you don't want glue. So, yeah, you just want to make sure that you wash it out when you use it. But you can use, yeah, any kind of powder and stuff that's not. I would say any anything that's biodegradable is probably the real best bet as long as it's in that. Okay. Bye, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Now, paint application. Um, this is where you're going to need to practice a lot on, on how you paint. Um, I've had people that I've taught how to paint and um, they paint and the, like they normally paint. It's going to be hard to explain. Um, you want the paint to adhere to the fabric. So if you paint really lightly, the, the, the paint's going to stay on top of all the, all the little hairs and on your fibers. It's not going to sink in. And it's going to have a, a uh, it's going to have the probability of coming off. So when you paint something, you want um, a sturdy brush, a small sturdy brush when you're initially painting, because you as you're painting, you want to make sure that you're pushing, you're giving a little bit of pressure on the brush and making sure that the paint is going on or on and into the fabric when you go. So it's going to be a pressure thing that you're going to have to learn how to do and not kill your brushes while you're doing it. But um, in the 70s, I believe, and maybe earlier, um, they I read some books that they said to add a little bit of water to your paint. Not a lot, um, probably as much as you would do medium or something. So your paint is about the consistency of uh, melted ice cream. That's not quite, you know, too liquidy. And what that does, basically, it, it helps the paint soak into your fabric because you really want it to hold on to your fabric and not come off. It, it's probably going to do it eventually. If it's not, if you don't use medium, um, if it's not soaked in, it's, you'll just have to go back and retouch things after a while, hopefully, if you do everything. So, but paint medium is a really good thing to make sure that you have mixed inside your paint. Now, I alter between putting down a base coat and not putting down a base coat. Um, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, the reason is that I try, whatever I'm painting, I don't want multiple layers if I can avoid it. Um, that's like I said before, it, it, weigh, it weighs down the fabric. And sometimes, um, which I found out, is that you may put a base coat down and whatever you, whatever you put on top of that doesn't stick to the paint you just put down. So that's gonna chip off first. And then you're just gonna have a base coat. And then that base coat might have, you know, don't chip off. So there's a lot of, things that you want, you know, you don't want to do. So you don't want to put a whole lot on there. Um, I do it on banners, which is on the left, um, just so that I go back, because I do a lot of shading with all of my paintings. So sometimes I'll put down a base coat so I can go back and uh, do some shading. Sometimes if I have enough energy, um, my normal is that I would paint and shade as I go. Um, but that's really, it's really tough on me and my body. But uh, sometimes it's best to have uh, your base coat's still wet, and then going back over and doing shading in different colors because you're mixing. You're mixing as you go, so it's something that I've learned over the years. But that's what I usually do. Um, and like, here's the dress that I was mentioning earlier. Um, I put it on a big tape, two tables, and uh, center of the dress is obviously in the center of that, and then the, I fanned it out so that way I can paint and draw on the dress and move my seat all the way around. Um, or if I get help, um, someone could be painting, you know, opposite me or, or if I'm painting uh, something that has multiple different colors, I'll have someone take, you know, a specific color, like say if I have something that's like three different colors, uh, each one of us will take a color and then we'll just kind of go around the table and, and paint on whatever we're painting on. It doesn't work well with tunics, but it, obviously big dresses and walls and everything like that, it, it works pretty well. Um, you can put a finishing coat on it. 
Now there's a thing called uh, ultra matte acrylic sealer and it should be in the textile craft paint section. Um, I use ultra matte because um, it seals it in. Now I don't use it because it, like it said, it uh, with paint is that adds weight to it. it. You know, it's like putting on another layer. So I don't always do it. Um, but when you paint an item, what happens is that um, yeah. if you were to look under a microscope, I guess, or look really super close um, at what you painted after it dries, you notice that uh, it's pulled the fibers together in some spots and away from each other in other spots, which means if you hold it up to the light after you finish painting, you'll see a whole bunch of you know tiny little holes in there. Um, so what you can do is to try and get it to adhere more is you would get the acrylic ultra matte acrylic sealer and you would paint over just the what you you know just what you painted um and if it dry when it when it dries you won't even know that it's on there so you really have to do it relatively quick because it's going to be hard to tell where you did it and where you didn't because it dries pretty pretty well um and what this will do is it dries clear but it will fill all those tiny holes that's in your fabric now and it'll 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 seal between those little holes between the, the the fabric and the paint a little bit better. Um, actually, you know, obviously one coat on on everything, but you can do that. I don't do it. Um, I did use regular matte finish, and it still came out glossy, and it was horrible. So I make sure I get ultra matte specifically. But they do have gloss too, but I didn't do that. Um, the, the reason why we started doing it is now it was a little easier to do. We could do, we could produce a lot of more stuff. We could do a lot of different designs. It didn't take as long as embroidery or uh, inkle. Um, and from a distance, you can't, uh, well, depending on how well you paint, it, you know, from a distance, it looks like it was embroidered or that it was, and uh, we've done trim where it actually looked like inkle. So it was a little cheaper, little way of doing it. Um, I mean, like I said, we could do a whole bunch of stuff. Me and my group, we've done tons of clothes for people. But uh, these are the four ones, Apple Barrel. I don't know. You might have to check. The reason I kind of briefly said the names of these paints, only because uh, everything went through hell, I guess, through this COVID thing. And that includes art supplies. So some companies went out of business. Uh, like I was trying to find a color a couple months ago and the factory closed down because of COVID. So it was hard to get paint. The paint was like, you know, some people took advantage and were like selling like $8 for a two ounce thing. The thing was crazy. Um, so I don't know if all of these companies are still in business, but and some of them changed their brands and stuff um, and colors. So if you like the color, make sure you get enough of the color because sometimes down the line I change colors. But. Um, on the right is just uh, fabric medium. Now the, the fabric, the little purple one that's on the screen, um, that one I believe is deco art. And I got that from, I think I got that one at Joann's. So I don't know, I don't think I've run into anywhere else, but deco art makes one. Uh, the one I usually get is on the right because I use a lot of it. And what I do is uh, as I'm buying these, you know, little bottles of paint and as I'm using them, um, I will try and figure out a way to mix in the medium into the original bottle um, and I mark it to make sure that I know that I've already mixed it in the medium. Um, so I use a lot of textile medium. I didn't used to, um, but I became a fan when I start, started seeing more and more of the stuff that I used to paint. And, uh, but only the only reason a lot of that stuff started chipping off because I, I did a lot for people who fought in uh, tournaments and stuff for fighting and stuff. So, and that paints, or or wars and stuff and that paint just flies off. So, but it's good for an event. Um, the middle one that's in that picture, um, Liquitex, that's the one that's for canvas, for painting on canvas for like portraits and, and landscapes and stuff that you would normally point, I guess, paint if you were doing like something similar to oil paints. And that's the one that I bought by accident. And that's when I found out about the, the different drying times which I didn't use, I ended up giving it to somebody. 
one of the big things that I used to forget about that I try and still remember to do is that after, if you're going to paint clothes, dress, tunic, whatever, um, for banners, I try and uh, coat them with um, Scotch Guard um, just to make sure that, you know, if somebody spills on it or, or dust, whatever, they can kind of wipe it off. I try and recommend, you know, I recommend they don't wash the banners because uh, it's washers even on a light cycle, hand cycle, or make sure if you're going to wash it, you do it by hand, which is what I recommend that you do with anything that you paint, any clothes that you paint, is to wash it by hand. Um, because, like I said, what I was going to say was that some dryer, some washing machines, even on delicate or they have a hand wash cycle, it's still, it's still there's friction going on in there somewhere, and it's going to, I have a tendency to worry about the paint. I turn them inside out too when I wash them. Um, in cold water, make sure it's cold. Uh, some washing machines don't always do 100% cold, which is must be a manufacturer thing. Make sure you wash it cold. Uh, prefer I prefer people wash it by hand and uh, hang dry it. Um, the reason I, I suggest that is because some of these acrylics, depending on how thick of acrylic you put on the fabric, um, like I mentioned with the ironing, um, if you're if you're even on air dry, some of your uh, dryers do it. There's enough heat in there somewhere that the paint will stick to itself. So you'll pull out whatever you painted on and you'll have different sections stuck to other sections. So it's, it's it could be a real mess. So um, I recommend uh, hang dry if at all possible. Um, but if you're going to just make sure you, you know, try not to uh, you know, get any heat, whether you're washing it or you're drying it at all. And really take care of your garments. Um, these are my final notes, just in general, for if anybody else has any questions. I got um, practice. Practice on things that you, you don't mind practicing on. So like just practice on a piece of fabric, um, practice with different paints, um, whatever you want to do. Do a lot of practicing on something that's not that important. Um, what I mean by that is don't, you know, put all your efforts into making a dress or a tunic or a banner or sewing, even if you're sewing parts of a wall and then, and then paint it um, for your first time or practice on it. Because if you ruin it, you, you just, you know, all that work goes down the drain. So practice and get, an, get the feel for the paint, get the paint, make sure the paint is in the fabric when you're painting it. Um, the big thing is uh, that I mentioned earlier on is is things that are within reach. You're going to have a habit of trying to get your paint close to where you're painting, which is obvious, kind of logical. Um, but you really need to try and make sure that it's in something or or whatever, so that even if you accidentally sneeze, maybe, and your hand goes out or something, or like I said, cat or cat or kid comes by, it's not going to go on your item, whatever you're painting on. Um, so yeah, just make sure your paint is secure wherever you put it and it's not easily going to be dumped over onto your item. But that's all I have. That's all the questions. That's all the stuff I have. I went really fast. Uh, there is a question in the chat. Sure. Uh, it says Raven mentioned a paint on fabric group. Is this a Facebook group? And what is the group name? Is it open to join? Yes, uh, it's open to join. It's uh, I got, should be known world painters. Like I said, you have to look under P A Y N T E R. To get onto it. Um, there's quite a few of us. Um, I laugh about this every once in a while. Is that I know three Bridgets in the SEA. Um, up until a couple weeks ago. And I'm still not 100% sure if they all know who each know each other, but I know three brigades that uh, live in three different kingdoms, and they all paint on fabric. But and some are a little, you know, more towards um, painting directly on fabric. You know, one is more uh, doing stamps and stuff like that, which which is different. 
sometimes uh, when you get into stamps, by the way, if you're stamping on fabric, um, majority of people that I know that use stamps and stamping on fabric do not use acrylic paints. They use anywhere from house paints to specific paints made specifically for stamping. So that's a whole nother kind of goofiness. But let me look it up real quick so I get the right words, right uh, name for it. Yeah, I started a local one and then I tried to, I'm trying to start uh, a, a known world one. Um, yeah, it's known world painter. So it's uh, N, uh, K N O W N E world W O R W O R L D and then painters P A Y N T E R S. Um, I'm still trying to transfer a lot of stuff over. Um, also, um, there is a, she's mistress. Now I believe she's in Trimaris or Countess. Yeah, Countess. But she's not, she also, she's now a Laurel too. So um, she has a different one as textiles, which I, I don't know if I can find out. She has one called textiles and she's got on that one, that's the one that she created long before I started. Um, but on hers, on the known world one, there's not a whole lot of reference yet in there. I'm still trying to down collaborate, but there are some references, like I said, on my handout, which let me let me put again in the chat. Should be some references on there. And I couldn't I couldn't um, Couldn't put all the references on there, but there's a lot. We kind of, we kind of shared our resources because um, it was hard to find them. Um, it was hard to find uh, references on because, like I said uh, in the beginning, there's a lot of conjecture on on how they painted or what they painted or when they painted. There's always kind of back and forth. Um, but we all, uh, you know. Me and my group and friends come and who think about painting on fabric. It's, it looks, if you do it well enough, it looks good. Um, it doesn't really stand out a whole lot, you know, as, you know, something that would be uncommon in, you know, uh, at least the look of it. So it's kind of like a faux historical in, in the sense of it on how it looks. Um, and it's a lot easier and it's, it's, it's less time consuming as you would if you, you know, if you didn't ha know how to embroider, if you didn't know any ankle weavers. Um, you could do kind of something like that. Um, and I, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but yeah, you have to make sure, uh, one of the things about putting a design on your, on your clothes is when you're thinking about design, because I mentioned about it being weight, having a weight issue, uh, your design needs to be somewhere between not knowing what it is. So you want it big enough so that you can at least from at least six feet away that we all should be right six feet away, um, should be able to tell what it is. So you want your design to be recognizable at least that far away. Um, but you don't want it too big. So you don't want it gigantic, um, which would you know probably look good, but it would weigh the fabric down so much and it would of <coughs> it chipping off and, and coming off. Um, and sometimes depending on uh, your fabric, um, I, we've had sometimes if you if you put too much paint on it, it'll actually rip the fabric, which is a whole other problem. So you want to watch how much paint and how much layers of paint that you put on there. And someone did the I saw uh, a link to uh, Bridget Bishop's painted textiles in the Middle Ages. Um, she she is what I call the guru. Um, we did a lot of talking back and forth at 50 year because um, you know, neither one of us knew about the one about someone else in the SEA painting on fabric. So it was, we had very a lot of long talks, but um, she has, she's been doing hers a lot longer than mine are. Um, I was just trying to get, I was attempting to try and get more, in, you know, more uh, interest. So that's the only reason I created my page, but I refer to her page a lot because she has a lot in her file section on references from books you can read. Um, uh, because uh, for the 
for those of you who don't know, the for the longest time there was uh, Stellini had a book out, and I don't know. At least the rumor was that uh, the book was about four hundred dollars. This was like in the '90s, I think, maybe earlier. And uh, one person in our kingdom had it, so he used one section of the book that talks about uh, he. It's a really good book if you can find it now. And I don't think it's it's like I don't know how much it is now. It's not four hundred dollars. Like I think I got it like forty bucks or something. Um, uh, and I don't have that reference. I might have that on my hand, but I'm not sure. Um, but it has a lot of. Uh, he, he goes through a lot of, in his time, in his histor in our historical time period, he goes through a lot of specifics on how they did frescoes and how they painted on uh, fabrics. And he goes through a lot of different arts. Some of it's a little vague because there's not a lot, whole lot of specifics. Um, but in the book is one of the first books that one of, you know, painting on fabric, we, people that painted on fabric always reference to. Um, the problem is, is a lot of conjecture because he talks about how the paint goes on to the fabric or that you can paint fabric and then eventually gets cut up for other things, which could be closed. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of spaces and, and stuff, a lot of stuff that he writes, but the book overall is a, is a very good book of, you know, at least a historical reference on what they did for different stuff. So that's what, that's why I got it originally. And trying to study guilds and everything else too. So, can you repeat the name of that book or the author? Yeah, um, I had it up here for the longest time. Let me ask my librarian. Uh, <laughs> can you, can you up? Even better, can you type out the name and the author in the yeah, chat? That's nice. Hold on, let me get over to the second section. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, Chanini. Yeah, I said Slini. Okay. No. So we say it in in, in Arizona. No, I don't. <laughs> but it's a good book. I, I usually try and have it. I'll, next time I teach this class, I'll make sure I have it close to me. I usually have it close to me. I don't have it. But I have that. I have a couple books like that, and I bought. I've also bought and purchased uh, books from the seventies, like I said, somewhere from the sixties of art books on how to paint on fabric. And obviously, you know, things have changed since then. But sometimes you can glean some of the uh, some of the ideas on maybe how to make things a little easier or to do something differently. So I buy. If it says if there's any kind of book that has painting on fabric. Okay, so I looked up two books from Chanini yeah. on Amazon. One of them's the Craftsman Handbook, Il Libro del Arte, That's and right. then and then the other one is a treatise on painting. Ooh, that's it. The treatise on painting. Yeah. Okay, I have both of them, so yeah. The second yeah, one. they're both kind of like you have to have them. Yeah, how much? Uh, I just want to give a five-minute warning. The okay. treatise on painting is listed as. Um, you can get a paperback copy for $14. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. 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 Cause it, it's every, it, it took every time they did a reprint, it, it lowered a little bit, but I think it's now, it's, yeah, now it's like 14 bucks. But I think when I bought it, it was like 40 bucks. That was like 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. So I'm glad it's getting, it's getting less. It says what it's is, a classic reprint. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It's, <laughs> It's an interesting read. It really is because it's, um, uh, like I said, it's from hist an historical view and what he observed people doing. I'm not 100% sure. I'm convinced he did any of the things, but he, it, I, I'm guessing he might have interviewed and talked to a lot of artisans and how they did things. So there are some facts as far as he's concerned, but there's a lot of like gaps. Yeah, he, he assumes you know a lot of things. So if you've read, if you're reading his book, he probably assumes you're very well educated, so you can just know things. <laughs> so, but those are that's a that's one of the main books there. But but um, there's also there's a lot of other books out there too. So like I said, there's a lot of uh, conjecture stuff. But, and my email is on my handout. So if you have any other questions or or anything else, just uh, feel free to email me, email me or. 
join one of those Facebook groups. Anybody else have any questions or any? Thank you very much. Just a thank you. Good job. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Yep. Thank, thank you. you Wonderful coming. class. Thank Sorry I was so late. Much. Thank you. Have fun. <laughs> so I appreciate everybody coming. Don't forget to save the chat for you guys that still need the links. Yes, yes please.